We've been teaching uh, the past uh, few weeks on decisions, making right decisions. We talked about how God gave us the right to choose. Talked about Bible characters making bad decisions or the wrong decisions. Uh, you know, Adam in the garden. David with Bathsheba, Abraham to hearken unto his wife Sarah, Israel when they wanted a king, hallelujah. Um, and then we talked about the fact we must make right choices and talked about how that, you know, Joel says there's multitudes in the valley decision. And then we started in on how to make the right decision. And our first point was just getting the right information. You cannot make a right decision without the right information. So let me tell you, number one, your, your friend Louise is not your right place to get your right information. Hello? I'm, I'm amazed at how many people will go to somebody who's had more problems than them to get counsel on what to do in a certain situation. I mean, I've got, you know, it's like, it's like going to the person who's been fired three times or quit seven jobs to get them to tell you what to do when something's going on at work you don't like. I tell you what I'd do. Yeah, we know what you would do. You've been fired seven times. Hello? You know, that, that's not real smart. Well, who would you want to listen to if you're having trouble at work? Go find you somebody that's worked in the same place for 42 years. <clears throat> Go to Mr. C's house. Go sit down with Mr. C and say, Mr. C, how did you keep and maintain a job wherever you worked for all those years without getting fired and without quitting and get, without getting frustrated? That's who you want. To, you don't want to talk to somebody that during the same period of time lost their job seven times. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Track record. Yeah. Y'all understand what I'm saying? So, you know, but it never ceases to amaze me how people will go to the, the very people that you really, that, that have demonstrated they don't know their head from a hole in the ground to get counsel. Why? Because they're going to tell them what they want to hear. I said, they're going to tell them what they want to hear. And, you know, you can never make good biblical quality decisions looking for what you want to hear. You have to find out what is the right thing to do in making decisions. And so for the believer, uh, we, we started with this, getting the right information comes from the Word of God. You know, Psalm 119, verse 89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Amen. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father but by me. In John 17, 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Amen. <clears throat> In Psalm 86, 11, teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth, unite my heart to fear thy name. Um, and, and one of the things we did talk about is not having the fear of the Lord. Or the awe, reverential fear, or awe of God. You know, um, we, we try so, so desperately in the church, especially in our circles, it seems that in the, in the charismatic word of faith circles, we tried to present, and, and, and listen, we just have to take up and fess up. We tried to present a gospel that has no consequences for disobedience, or no consequences for not doing the right things, or no consequences for not doing what the word says. We try to present everything as hunk of door and lovely, you know. God, God, God is a good God. Well, God is a good God, but you know what? God is a good God who's made a way where you can, can escape. God has made a good, good God who's given you promises that you can, and what did Peter say? Wherefore, given to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these, amen, we may part, be partakers of the divine nature. Amen. Goes on, Peter, and says that you know we're having escaped the the uh, the lust of the world, the the um, oh, the what? Corruption. The corruption of the world through lust. <clears throat> the word of God. God's made and provided a means whereby we as believers can come out and be free and liberated. But it is it's no by no means meaning that He's good. Means that if you don't do what His word tells you, that you're you're going to be absolved for the consequences of the wrong decisions. And that's not what the Word teaches. The Word never taught that. Amen. I posted this week, um, and I've taught these things before, but, but I posted this week uh, Tony Cook's article on what is Scripture for. and taught, uses that Scripture where it says the Word of God is profitable for reproof, rebuke, and, uh, instruction of righteousness, and correction. correction. Amen. So for doctrine, for reproof. For correction and righteous, for instruction, in righteousness and correction. There's four things there. It's two of them are what we would call positive. That is doctrine and instruction and in righteousness. Two are correction and reproof. Well, that, those are not positive 
in the sense of you enjoying it. No one wants to be corrected and no one wants to be reproved, do they? Yet the Word of God says that the, Paul writes to Timothy, you're to do, the, the Word of God's profitable in all these areas. And then it goes on in that same verse, it says this, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So you're going to, in order to be thoroughly furnished unto every good work, you're going to be reproved and you're going to be corrected. And you're going to be instructed in righteousness and you're going to walk in the doctrine of the Lord. Amen. Amen. If you're going to be, uh, and, and if you're going to be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So, <clears throat> you know, in order to make right decisions, the Word of God has to come into play. And there's going to be things the Word of God says you don't like. Just go ahead and fess up to it. I know people say, I don't need to go to church. I'm, I mean, I'm under grace. I don't have to go to church. Yeah, but the Bible says to forsake not your, uh, the assembling together uh, of yourselves as is the manner of some. In other words, there are people who don't assemble themselves, yet the Word of God says don't do that. Why? Because iron sharpeneth iron. A threefold cord is not easily broken. You know, there's counsel, there, there's safety in the multitude of counselors. They're talking about biblical counselors, not Looney Tune counselors. You know, I remember a number of years ago, Dear Abby, uh, somebody wrote to me and said, I'm a homosexual. I don't understand why God made me this way. She wrote back, you go ahead and be who God made you. I'm thinking, that's not counsel. That's Bozo writing, writing paper column. Everybody thinks Dear Abby knew what she was talking about. She didn't know what she's talking about. It's like going and getting counsel from Dr. Phil on the Oprah show. Or going and, you know, and going and getting on Mari's show and letting them give you instruction on how to live. Or we were, I was at the, uh, Nathan had to get some immunization shots the other day. He had to go get his um, uh, meningitis and, his, and, and a tetanus, another tetanus for college. You have to have them by law or you can't go to school. And so we were sitting in the doctor's office and they had the Wendy show on. And she giving people counsel on what to do in your relationship with men. And I'm, and she, and I, I'm not going to repeat what she said, but let me tell you, it wasn't biblical counsel. Because if I had been there, I'd say, stay out of bed until you're married. So it solves all the problems. You don't have to be concerned about doing D, DNA tests to find out who the daddy is if you don't have a baby. Now, Pastor, I've made that mistake. Listen, I'm not, I'm not condemning you. I'm saying that the love of God can restore you. But the people who haven't gotten there, the best way not to have to deal with that is don't have sex outside of marriage. Then when you do get married, don't have sex with who you're married to. Then you don't have to wonder who the daddy is. Hello. You don't have to be concerned if you've got an STD. You don't have to wonder if, you know, I mean, with Magic Johnson, let me tell you something. The women who didn't have sex with Magic Johnson didn't have to worry about having AIDS from him when he found out he had AIDS and said he slept with 20,000 women. You didn't have to worry. If you didn't sleep with him, you didn't have to worry about it. The women who did, did go, well, I mean, the women who never slept with him didn't go, oh man, I better go get checked. They knew they hadn't. See, good decisions, godly decisions are based on what the Word of God teaches us. And the Word of God is an instruction book on how not, on how to make right decisions and how not to make wrong decisions. It, it, so, so really the right decision is not, is also uh, by default not making the wrong decision. So not making wrong decisions and making right decisions. If you'll do what the Word of God says, you will always make the right decision. Hey, look at Joshua 1.8. This is a decision verse. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. Moses has been taken up. Jo the, the mantle of leadership has fallen to Joshua. Or as Brother Hagin says, Joshua. You live in this old day, Hagin takes it, he'll call him Joshua. <laughs> Hallelujah. Look at the book of Joshua. <laughs> he just loved that. Hallelujah. And I know I say things funny sometimes. I come up and, and mutilate words. It says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Why? That thou mayest observe to do. What's that? Make right decisions based on what the Word says. Observing to do is making decisions based on what the Word says. That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. What? For then, or because of this, thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. Or one translation says this, and even my, mar uh, one, my margin says do wisely. Another translation says shall uh, um, deal wisely in the affairs of life. That's making good decisions, isn't it? If you're, do, if you're doing wisely or, or making wise decisions or dealing wisely in the affairs of life, those are right decisions. Where did it come from? Meditating in the Word. The Word is an instruction book on how to do the right thing. 
Amen. If you want to know what to do, go to the Bible. Don't go to Louise, like I said earlier. I tell you what I do. I mean, they'll, they'll get. I mean, you know, they'll, they'll get the talking and they'll get the neck to go and they'll get the. They'll get all mad and they'll spew it out all their anger about their experience in life. See, we don't make our decisions based on experiences or other people's experiences. We make it based on what the Word says do. Because your experience can teach you to do one thing and the Bible say another. All right. This book of the law shall not depart. That's why I say your friends are not good bouncing boards if they're not going to give you godly counsel. Yeah. Now, here's how you know. When you say, what would you do? And they say, well, the Bible says, okay, open up. But if they go, I'll tell you what I would do, that's it. Say, sorry, I don't need to hear that. Yeah. Why? Because that's not biblical counsel. I said, that's not biblical counsel. It may be redneck counsel, but it's not biblical counsel. It may be fighting counsel, but it's not biblical counsel. And then number two, on just a side journey on this, don't go post all over Facebook your stupidity. I'm thinking, I see people post stuff and I think, don't you know you got friends at work who are reading what you're saying and going and telling the boss, dummy? I hate my job. That's a great thing to say on Facebook. Because there's somebody at work just honoring enough to go show the boss that you hate the job that he just gave you. That's not a, that's just a dumb, dumb decision. That's stupidity on steroids. The people I work with are jerks and idiots. That's great. Post that all over Facebook. How about go pray for them idiots and jerks? That God will bless them. Amen. Instead of posting all over Facebook, how sorry they are. Anyway, sorry. Just this, thought, this kind of a sub. You know, we live in a we live in a technological and social media world, and so we have to tell you things not to do now. That we didn't have to tell you five years ago. We didn't have to tell you not to tell, put stuff on Facebook. People didn't know what Facebook was. Amen. Like one guy said, if you keep your face in the book. <laughs> Hello? You'll know what to do. Hallelujah. Praise God. So, and that's what we're saying here. Joshua 8 is keeping your face in the book, not on Facebook. Because you can put out there on Facebook and say, I, I, I believe this, da, da, da. what do you think? And you'll get all, you'll get, you'll get venom. I mean, you'll get people hating. You'll get people mad. You know, anyway. Isn't that right? John 8, 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, or the Word. It'll make you free what? It'll make you free to make the right decisions. I'll tell you, there's nothing better in life to know that you made the right decision, even if it doesn't look right on the outside to everybody else. Because you know in your heart you did the right thing. You know that God will honor what you did. Amen. I, I, I did something a number of years ago, it, 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 it cost me in the natural. It cost me relationships with people for years, but I did the right thing. It was a tough thing to do. Let me just tell you, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't want to get into it, but I'm going to tell you, it was a very difficult, and I paid a price in the natural, but you know what? I made the right decision before the Lord. And so I can sleep at night, you know, all the other people are mad at me and didn't like what I did. Um, I did before the Lord. I, I have a clear conscience and a pure heart. And I don't have to, I don't have to sit around and go, did I, make the right, did I make the wrong decision or make the right decision by not doing that? I did what, what the right thing was. And it's something I had to do and it had to be done right or it was going to cost me in the long run. It, with God. I'm going to tell you something. If I have a choice between upsetting somebody else and, and pleasing God, I got to please God. And we all have to do that. And right decisions are those that please God, even if they upset other people. You don't do it maliciously to upset them, but if the choice comes down to upsetting others or pleasing God, you've got to please God. So you have to do what the Word says. Jesus told his disciples, you, you, you may have to leave father, mother, family, sister, brother. Now you'll be rewarded for it in this life, but I'm telling you, you know, none of you've left them. Now listen, they, in other words, they had to make a decision to follow the Lord or stay with their families. And they chose to follow the Lord. That's not always easy. So I'm not saying right decisions are always going to be the easy decision. Usually, you found this out in life, just in natural things. The right decision is the most difficult, and in some sense, it seems the most costly decision. 
Amen. Um, how many? How many know this? You know, nobody. You know, our school systems and all these parents. You know, you go to the, we can't tattle anymore. Well, if someone's doing something wrong that it's endangering or, or destructive, informing someone is not tattling. It's the thing, it's the right thing to do. Now you get ostracized. Je I'm telling you, a number of years ago, Jesse was um, on the JV soccer team at her, at her high school, and um, a girl was, pa the, the soccer captain was passing out a sheet to all the players. And on that particular team, they, um, they would bring, this school would always bring up eighth graders and stuff and let them play varsity if they thought they were really good. And it's a private school, so you can get away with it. You can't do it in public, but in private schools, you can. They let them do it in private schools. And uh, so they had eighth graders there. And um, this girl was the superstar captain of the soccer team and came to, a, to, came to a, an away game and on the bus passed out a sheet of paper of how soccer girls do it better. They do it on the ball. They do it on the pitch. You know, and we all know the innuendo there. It's not they play soccer better than everybody else. It's they have sex better. That, the innuendo is soccer girls are better at sex because they do it on the pitch or they do it on the ball. I mean, all the different, those, those things. And they have these things for a lot, a lot of different sports and a lot of different things. But here's the captain of the team passing this out to the whole team, which is number one. She's the leader. She's, it's a Christian school. She's supposed to be the spiritual leader also. She's supposed to demonstrate a godly lifestyle. Well, my daughter was furious. And she came on and told us about it. And, um, and so we went, and we went to the, um, to, the, to the coach about it, and he blew me off. So I went to the athletic director about it. I mean, he just absolutely blew me off. Got, got mad with me because wow, I'm messing with the See, his bad example. Well, we went to the AD. They were going to deal with it. And uh, so they, they called the girl in, and they started dealing with it. The dad wants to know who, who told. And that coach told him. So you know what happens the next day. Who, 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 is the, who is the horrible person? Who is the most venomous, evil person in the school? My daughter. The team rallies around the godless actions of the captain because she got in trouble and has a team meeting and without ever calling her name says, if you've got a problem, you come to us. How do we even come to us? You're the leaders. How can we go to the leaders about their sin? You know, it went to the right place. Now, they told the dad, the dad told the daughter, the daughter told the team. Guess who got ostracized? My daughter. And I went to the coach about it, and he blew me off again. But well, I'm going to tell you what, that was not happening. And here, here's the punishment for the team captain. Not one minute of field, field time did she miss. Not one second. She had to carry the ball bag to the field for two weeks which was a demotion. You know, the, my daughter usually had to carry it because she wasn't the star. So your, your penalty is carrying the ball bag out to the field. See, when you make the right decisions. Now listen, um, the, the, the male soccer coach pulled her aside one day in class and said, Jessica, you did the right thing. You know, and, and you, know, you stood up for what was right, and I'm proud of you. And I know you're paying a price right now, but you did the right thing. He encouraged her that she had done the right thing. We've always appreciated that because, you know, uh, he, he saw what was happening was wrong. But you see, you know, that coach, that coach apparently had enough power to, to override any, anything else that was going on. He's no longer there. He, that was his last year. I don't, he, um, no, that, they were cooking the books. Anyway. <laughs> the dad kept stats, the, the team stats kept stats, and at the end of the game, if they didn't match it where his daughter was, was a superstar, they changed the stats. <laughs> yeah. So when she got ready to go to college, all her stats were high for the college to look at. They didn't, they didn't look at all the films, they looked at her stats, and they, they cooked the books to make her look good. Well, I'm going to tell you something. That doesn't catch up with you right tomorrow, but it will catch up with you. Now, I'm saying all this because when you make a right decision, it may look like you're paying a price. <clears throat> but you never pay a price with God when you do the right thing. Amen. When you do the right thing with God, he keeps a good tally book. I say he keeps a good tally book. <clears throat> and we're seeing right now certain things happen with, in, in Jessica, in Shannon's life, with Rama that are only because they've done the right things over the years and made the right decisions. 
They're getting, they're getting persecuted by Rama students. PKs who think they're better than everybody else. They ain't done a thing. They've done nothing but go to everybody else. But, and I thought, forget these people. Don't worry about these people. The people who, who need to know, the, the people that, that are, are involved in your life, that are promoting you, know who you are, know what your character is. And you're not self-promoting, God's doing it. They just had the, the, uh, the leader of uh, the youth, um, the um, singles ministry, the, uh, the assistant to come up to them and ask them to join their planning board last week so they could help plan stuff for the, for the singles ministries. Just, they weren't trying to get a job. He just walked up to them and said, hey, I need you girls to help me. When you make right decisions, it may look like there's a price at one point, but God will always pay and honor and bring uh, respect later. Amen? You just do the right thing. Amen? Um, hallelujah. Let's, let's see here. Let's see. Let's, let, second thing, making the right decision. I got a bunch of other scriptures. We could go on those. Act on that information alone. Don't go with find what the Bible says and go, go, try to go get somebody else to give you an out on the part you don't like. Hello? Let me say the grace message. There's so many wonderful things about the message of grace. But the extreme grace message where, you know, people say, well, you don't have to repent because you're in the grace. God's already taking care of that. And the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John, 1 John 1, 8, 9, and 10 is talking to the believer. They start saying it doesn't belong to it. That's not talking to the believer. They even got one Bible who just went ahead and wrote a Bible and left that out. Because it doesn't apply to the believer and since there's such controversy, we just left that out. Yeah. This love it when people leave parts. And then now, now the big hot thing is going around is don't, don't read Peter, James, or John because Paul disagreed with them and argued with them about grace. They, they argued with Paul about grace. And so don't read them. What? I'm going to tell you something. When somebody stands up in a pulpit or somebody stands up in your little Bible study circle or somebody tries to counsel you and says, don't read Peter, James, and John, slap them and run for the hills. <laughs> get out of there as fast as you can get out of there. Why? You can't add to or take away from the Bible. You can't go in there and say, well, because this doesn't line up with what we want to believe, we don't read that part. Right. Why? You have eliminated part of your decision-making paradigm to make right decisions. And it could be the vital part. Amen. We act on that information alone. James 1, 21 through 25 says this, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save. That word save is sozo, but it saved your suke, your soul, not your spirit. He's not talking about getting born again here. He's talking about renewing or restoring the soul. Amen. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man beholding his natural face in the glass. Um, for behold, he goeth himself and goeth, he, he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, and be not, and not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Amen. Isn't that right? Hallelujah. So, he says here, be do as the word and receive. The word receive here. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of knowledge and receive with meekness. This word means it's used of the thing offered in speaking, teaching, or instructing to receive favorably, to give ear to, to embrace, to make one's own, to approve, and not to reject. Not to reject. When somebody's teaching what the whole counsel of the Word of God says, you've got to let it in. And when it goes cross grains what you want to hear, tough. You can't make a right decision. Let me, let me, let me ask you this. Now, how many remember about 15 years ago, a barge on the Arkansas River ran into the I-40 pier and knocked the bridge out? Anybody remember that happening? And cars were going off the bridge into the water? Remember that happening? Anybody remember that happening? Well, that, that, that bridge is not a flat bridge. It's, it's an arch bridge. It's like this. Okay? He knocked the pier out. He, he, they think he was drunk or fell asleep or both. 
and ran it right into the pier, knocked it out the bridge, bridge collapsed, and, and numerous vehicles, tractor trailers, and everything just went right in the water. Now, say you're, you're, you're at the gas station, I pull in to get gas before I get to that bridge. I say, hey, is I 40 go this way? Yep. But the bridge is out. And I go, I don't receive that. Yeah. <laughs> Before it goes this way, I'm taking off, I'm going down the road. And I floor it. And there's a barrier out there that says, you know, exit road, bridge out. And you just bust through the barrier. Why? I don't receive that. I reject that. I bind that negative sign in Jesus' name that's impeding my progress to go east and to get to North Carolina. Guess what we're going to be doing? Dearly beloved, we've come together today to honor the life of so-and-so. You know, you can, you can say, I don't receive that. What was that? That's part of the information you've got to have. Yeah, 40 does go that way, but the bridge is out. The bridge isn't there right now. You can't go that way. Guy ran into it, not the pier out, it's, it's crashed into the river, and they're working feverishly 24-7 to repair that and to rebuild that bridge, but you can't go that way. I reject that. See, the Bible's full of things like that. It tells you there's a path we're on with God, and there's lots of wonderful, glorious things. You're healed, you're blessed, coming in, blessed going out, God's got all this, but it also has warnings about things along the way. And you just can't go, I reject that. Why? That is part of the information necessary to progress and to keep going. Without that information, you're endangering yourself. They'll even put signs up. Road closed, bridge out, two miles. And you got Christians who get the same kind of warning signs in the Word of God, and they go, I don't receive that. That's not for me. That was for the Jews. Well, I don't care who you are, you crash the sign, you're going to go in the river. And you crash God's warning signs, and you're going in the river. And it could cost you your life. I don't receive that, I'm, I'm, I'm under grace. I don't care what you're under. If the Bible says don't do something, you do it anyway, it could cost you your life. I read one time when somebody, we were, uh, they were blogging along these lines and about, and they said, now that I'm under grace, I don't have to give, and I don't have to tithe, and I don't have to obey, and I don't have to go to church, and I don't have to, and they just listed all litany of things they don't have to do. Well, fine, dummy. You keep that up, you'd be poor, broken, dead. Hello? I don't have to obey. What do you do with the Scripture that says obey those with the rule over you? Submit yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. What do you do with those scriptures? They're not for me. How come they're not for you? Because I'm under grace. No, 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 no. The whole counsel of the Word of God is involved in you making those decisions. And you, and you can't go listen to preacher so-and-so who tells you that this doesn't apply to you. I'm going to tell you something. If it's in the New Testament, it applies. <clears throat> I mean, uh, we, can, we, can, now, we can go look at the Old Testament, but the Bible says they're written for our example. Amen. So you just can't throw the Old Testament all out. There are certain, we're not under the Levitical law. We know that. that. The Bible teaches us that. But the principles of the Levitical law, there are principles in there that, you know, homosexuality is really listed, really clear in the, in the Levitical law. And just because it's not listed as clear or as straightforward, if you do that, you'll die. In the New Testament, people say, because Jesus did the same thing about it, he didn't apply anymore. No, no, no. You read what Paul, Paul makes it very clear. He says, when men leave the natural use of the woman, burn the lust one to another, working that which is unseemly, receiving in themselves their just recompense and reward, he ain't talking good things for the homosexual. Right, 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 right. He's just not saying, he's not saying it's, a, it's an okay lifestyle. But you got a lot of homosexuals who hate Paul. Why? Because he said the lifestyle was wrong. You can't have it both ways. Amen. Had we dealt with AIDS the right way to begin with, we would never have the problem because it was because it was primarily in the homosexual community. It was it was a politically correct disease. You couldn't tell anybody that they had AIDS. Had it been any other disease, you would have been you would have been marked with a with a with a red stamp or some kind of seal to keep you from being involved in other people because it was going it was going to spread a deadly disease. All right. The Bible is full of warning, and you may not like what the Bible says. And if you, let me say this, and if you don't, you got a problem. 
Because if you're born again, love God with all your heart. You know, what did David said? He said, said, uh, he said, he said um, I've hid my word, thy word in my heart. Why? Why did he hide his word in, the, in his heart? That I might not sin against you. He didn't want to sin against God, so he hid God's word in his heart. If you love God, you're going to want to do what God's word says. You're, when people say, I don't, want, I don't like that part of the Bible, what's wrong with you? What is wrong with you? What message have you heard from somebody that you don't want to do what God's Word says to do in certain areas of life? That you've been liberated from obedience to the Scriptures. I'm not going to say it's going, you know, that, uh, that if, you, if you don't give this week, you're going to die and go to hell. Or you know, if you don't give this week, you're going to lose your salvation. But I've I, I got a serious question. If you're born again, you declare that you love God and that you're a Christian and that you're under his grace, then why wouldn't you want to do what his word says do? Because that's law. No, it's not. That's the dumbest mess I ever heard. You can't take, they, they use where Paul talks about law, and he's really talking about the Levitical law. He's not, even talking about, he's not even talking about any other law. He's talking about Levitical law. You read Paul's writings, he is, every time he uses the word law, he is in reference to the Levitical law. The, the law of washings and ordinances and those things that bring you, in, that bring you into salvation. You've got Christians now who don't want to obey the laws of God after they're saved. Let me say this. God said obey. That is a law to you as a believer to obey. God said to submit. That is a law to the believer to submit. The Bible says to love one another. That is a law to the believer called the law of love. You love one another. Amen. You get the information from the Word of God and you act on that information. And any input you get from anywhere else should undergird and, and if it's going to bring balance or, or clarity, it should be from the Word of God. Well, I did a study and found out that wasn't written to the believer. No, come on. And you sold how many millions of books preaching that garbage? How much money did you make preaching that we don't have to obey the, and we don't have to obey the Bible? No, you act on the Bible. Amen? And you do not reject. What that translation means, not to reject. Receive with meekness. The, see, your attitude to the Word of God has to be, if you're going to make right decisions, your attitude to the Word of God has to be that if the Bible says it, if the Word of God, God declares it, that's how I live. And it may make your flesh angry. I don't want to get up on this rainy Sunday afternoon. I don't want to climb out of my bed. It's dark in the room and it's raining outside and it's, it's misty and it's cool. It's been hot and sunny and now it's misty and cool. I don't want to get up out of bed and pull them that nice down comforter off and go to church tonight. Well, aren't you glad I decided to do that because I wouldn't be preaching if I didn't? Me, yeah, I'm, I'm all comfy and tucked in my bed. Had my down comforter over. It was dark outside. The misty and, the, and, and it actually rained pretty hard for a while. I mean, that's, I'll just put you into another world. <laughs> and the clock went off me to get up to kind of get ready and, you know, to stir around and that kind of thing. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, and I, and I could have gone, man, I, don't, I ain't going to church tonight. I don't have to go. You know? Yeah, God called me to preach, but I'll preach whenever I feel like it because I'm under grace. It just doesn't matter when I do it. <laughs> And you all show up and I'm not here. Now let's reverse that. You're home this afternoon, laid in your comforter, and the clock goes off, and uh, you don't want to get up. I don't want to go to church. Pastor Ed won't miss me. Well, it's not a matter if I miss you or not. You're going to get information that's going to help you make right decisions in life. Now, and not, and not just when I'm preaching on making right decisions. You're going to get information when we're preaching on healing on how to deal with disease. You're going to get information when we're preaching on prosperity on how to deal with finances. You're going to get information when we're teaching on the family on how to, how to govern your household. You're going to get information when we're talking about living by faith that's going to help you make the right decisions about the faith walk. So whatever we're preaching is going to be an aid to you when we're preaching the Word of God than if we're preaching the Word of God. Now, if we're preaching, I don't believe this, is, I don't believe this, then we just threw that part out and we don't act on that because that's not, that was for the Jews or that's not for the church or that's this, that, whatever. There are occasional things in the Bible, like women come to church with a head covering. Well, the word woman and the word wife in the Greek is the same word. You've got to take it in context. And it's talking about the covering of their husband. You've got to get the clarity of what it meant, but you don't take it out of the Bible. Well, I don't believe that. Women shouldn't have to wear little doilies. So we take that part out. We don't read that scripture. Well, it's, it wasn't talking about little doilies. It was talking about being under the authority of their husband. 
That is the meaning of that passage. You know, wise. Because how do you know? Because it said, ask your husbands when you get home. That couldn't be talking about all women because if all women, because not all women had husbands. So it had to be talking about wives. Let the women be silent in the church. If they have anything, as they ask their husband at home. You see, see, talking about being under the authority of their husbands. Submitted to their husbands as Abraham submitted himself to, I mean, as Abraham submitted himself to Sarah. Yeah, that's the new way of doing things. The Bible way was Sarah submitted himself to Abraham. Now, listen, you understand that. That is submission in biblical ways. That is not unbiblical things. Then one man came home and told his wife, now, this, is, this, this, this is how crazy people get. You, you, I want you to have sex with um, this couple here we watch because, um, you know, you, you're my wife and I'm your, I'm your husband and you have to submit to me. No, you don't. That's sin. There ain't a woman's got to obey her husband when he tells her to do something that's against the Bible. So if you're out there using manipulation on your wife to make her do things that are contrary, she's the handmaid of the Lord. She only follows you as you follow Christ. He's the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and gave himself for it. If you're not leading your house like Christ loves the church, your wife don't have to do what you say do if it's contrary to the Bible. You bozo. Somebody will take you out back and beat you. In love, of course. <laughs> See, there's times I want to break the Bible and go lay hands on people hard, fast, and continuously. And the Bible says lay hands on no man. Suddenly there's times I just think, I'm, I want to do it hard, fast, and continuously. Now, making right decisions is really the right the lifestyle of faith. Faith is a hard decision rather than a mental decision. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It takes a decision of the heart to act on, by faith and do God's Word. Every circumstance demands a choice or decision whether you will believe God or the circumstance. Amen? John 12, let's look over there. We'll read a couple of verses and then we'll let you go. Y'all enjoyed this teaching? This is the last service. Just about to finish up on this. John 12, starting in verse 37. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. That the saying of Isaiah, or, or Isaiah, we'll, just say, we'll read the, uh, the one you understand. Isaiah is Isaiah. The prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the Lord of the, of the arm of the Lord be revealed. If you go read Isaiah 52, 13, 14, and move into the top, the first verse of chapter 53, this is, this is a quote from there. Therefore, they could not, they could not believe, because it, Isaiah said, again, he hath blinded their eyes and the heart of their hearts, so they should not see with their eyes and not understand with their heart and be converted, and I would heal them. But listen here, they couldn't, well, they first chose not to believe and then they couldn't believe because they, their eyes are blinded. I'm telling you, it is a dangerous thing to reject the Word of God. Just because you don't like what it says. Because it puts a responsibility in you. Because cool, slick preacher says you don't have to. There's a book out uh, called Love Wins. But it's, just, it's, it's a universalist book, it's ungodly, it's not biblical. You know, nobody, hell is what you make. It says in the book, hell is what you make it. You know, you go to heaven, but you'll be in torment or hell because you are not fully obeying God. But eventually, love's going to win, and you're going to obey God. Nobody goes to hell. Love wins. But there's no Bible to back that up. In other words, the, the author actually says hell's not a real place. You know, it's not, it's not a little place where it's just tormenting and anguish. Yet Jesus said that people will be cast out into utter, out of darkness with weeping and gnashing of teeth. Torment, weeping, and gnashing of teeth. Man, preacher so and so up in the Midwest knows more than the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church, the second person of the Godhead, God Himself. Thank you very much. Hello. When you choose to reject the Word of God, and, and see, people like this always speak in nuances. Well, there are those who disagree with it. There are many scholars. I don't care what the scholar says. Jesus said it. You don't have to have a scholar tell you that those who disobey God are cast into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. You don't have to have a theological conference to try to figure out what he meant. It's pretty doggone plain. What? You're going to be cast out where there's dark, outer, dark, outer darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hello. And he also says that when death and hell gave up the, their grave, they were gave up their dead, they were judged, and then they were cast into the lake of fire, which burned forever and ever, which is the second death. 
Hello? Jesus said that. Hello? John writing there to the church. Think about this. People come along and then tell you that what Jesus said is not really what God meant. What? How can you pre call yourself a preacher and then tell everybody that when Jesus said that those who didn't believe were cowed to outer, outer darkness was weeping and gnashing your teeth and then go say there's no such thing as hell? Click. Bye. Person who pretends to be a pastor. If you're a true pastor, you'll say what the Bible says. Jesus told Peter, he said, if you love me, feed my sheep. What's he going to feed them? His good word. Don't we, we need, we need the Bible. Amen? That went over, but good. He has blind eyes and harden their hearts so they should not see with their eyes or understand with their heart and be converted and I shall heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. Uh, also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Think about this. There were many people in the synagogue who believed on Jesus, but wouldn't confess him for fear of being put out and losing their status. How dumb can you be? And Jesus cried out and said, He that believeth on me believeth not on me, but him that sent me, and he that sent, uh, seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I am coming to the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. <coughs> And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came to, not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one judge, one that judgeth him. The world that I have, I have, and the word that I have spoken, the same shall be the judge in the last day. <laughs> now you see how important it is to obey, do what the word says. Jesus said, I'm not even going to judge them. He said, I'm going to preach my word, and if they reject that in the last day, my word will be their judge. Why do you think there is an all-out attack against the Word of God? I saw some guy writing not, not that all that long ago that we, the written Word is not that important. We actually, we need the, we, you know, I read the Bible. It's a good book to read, but we just need the Holy Ghost. You talk about leaving. What happens when you do that? Every goosebump somebody gets is their leading of God. That's God's Word to them. There's no baseline. Now, how many know you cannot run any kind of study Statistical study, you can't run any kind of, uh, of science experiment, chemistry experiment. And there's nothing you can do without what they call a baseline. You have to have a baseline or a standard by which you measure everything against to understand or to interpret, to extrapolate and interpret the data in a way that makes sense. If there is no baseline, what happens? It has no sense, of, it has no sense, it's nonsensical. Which is why what we refer to as amoralism, situational ethics, um, the, the, the morality of the atheism, A, a is, is the, um, the prefix meaning non. A, theism is the belief that there is no God. A, morality is the position that there are no morals other than what you believe they are. Well, if you believe it's all right to kill people, you'll go around and kill people and say, who are you to judge me? You know, and we can go, we can go right down our whole road on this, uh, this whole thing. I don't want to do that. Jesus said, now let me say, when, when the attack has come on the Word of God, there's an attack on the written Word of God like you've never seen before in the earth. Why? You remove this from your decision-making paradigm, and it simply becomes how you feel or what you think or your buddies think about it. There is no standard, there is no basis by which we measure against to say this is right or wrong. And that's, and that's what the homosexual community and, and, and all these people are doing now. They're trying to say, you know, they want, they want God out of the classroom. Well, you can separate your church and say, let me tell you, the second they don't have a, the Christian God or the Ten Commandments or whatever in the classroom, we have adopted secular humanism, which is a religion. It is the belief in a non-God. 
And we are, the, the state has adopted a non-God religion. And it is, it, it, and, and it is not separated from the state. It is shoved down the kids' throats. Amorality, situational ethics, atheism is shoved down the kids' throats. You show up in school with a picture of, a, of Jesus on your book and you're sent home because you brought, you brought Christianity into the school system. Forget their First Amendment rights. You know, and I'll be, I, I'll be, I wish we could get, do like the progressives have done the past 60 years and stack the courts with a bunch of constitutional conservatives and we started passing laws concerning the, pro, on the prohibition clause. Congress shall pass and make no law concerning the establishment of religion, nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That's just as much a part of the First Amendment uh, as the Establishment Clause. And actually, the Establishment Clause, they've just said just by having the Ten Commandments is passing a law by default. That's not passing a law. That's not a law to have the Ten Commandments on a building. That is not a law. And, and, and to go as far as to say, and just like Roberts did with taxing us for non-commerce can reasonably be viewed as a tax on the individual mandate. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. That's like if you go here and go to, go to Walmart this afternoon, walk in the store and walk back out, and they say you owe 6.5%, uh, 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 you know, you owe $6.50. Why? We're taxing you for non-commerce. And the tax right here is 6.5%, 6, is 6 so we just do it on a random number of $10. You're being, you know, you're, you know it's a penalty. No, you, you came in here, you're being taxed for coming in here and, and engaging in non-commerce. These are the crazy things that happen in life. Amen? Now, the attack of the Word of God is to remove from society and from men's hearts a baseline by which we measure things as to whether they're moral, right, godly, the plan of God, or not. And Jesus said, listen, if you don't do what I said, do, I'm not going to judge you because when you stand before the throne, my Word will be your judge. Why do you think there's an attack on the Bible? So that people will disregard it. Satan wants as many people going to hell as he can get there. His whole goal is to take as many people and disrupt the plan of God as much as he poss possibly can and take as many people to hell as he can take to hell. And so if he can get you to disobey the Word of God and, and, and not do what the Word of God says and reject the Word of God, when you stand before the throne of God, Jesus won't stand up and say, I judge you because you didn't do this. The Word of God will be there and says, the, the Word of God said this, I, and it judges you. Jesus said, my Word will judge you. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Then we better pay attention to the word so we can make decisions that line up with the word. I think that's a pretty good, a pretty good interpretation. Do what the Bible says. I don't have to obey. What the Bible says, obey. Now, who are you going to listen to? Cool preacher or Bible? I don't have to submit. The Bible says to submit yourselves. Who are you going to listen to? Cool preacher or Bible? I don't have to give. Jesus said, give and it shall be given unto you. Who are you going to listen to, cool preacher or Bible? How about, how about cool preacher or Jesus? <laughs> Amen? Hello? I don't have to go to church. Who are you going to listen to, Bible? Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as a man of some, or cool preacher? I don't have to repent. Who are you going to listen to, cool preacher or Bible? Yeah, but he's cool. Got a cool hairstyle. Uses a lot of technology. He's cool. See, I want to tell you something. I, I was talking with lunch with, with Matt, uh, Brother Matt today, and we got talking about the Nixon-Kennedy debates. Everyone who heard the Nixon-Kennedy debates for, for the presidency on the radio thought Richard Nixon won hands down. He, he knew what he was talking about. He was far more intelligent. He understood the matter. Foreign policy, and his foreign policy was his main forte. He understood it at a level that Kennedy was, he just, he smoked Kennedy. Hands down. Everyone who saw on television thought Kennedy won. Because they thought he was a good looking a New England Catholic. He was polished in his, Kennedy, you know, said Nixon was not a great looking guy. But you know what? The Bible says Jesus wasn't either. He had no, no form, no comeliness that we should desire him. That's what the Bible said. Think about that now. So, so Nixon wasn't the best looking president we ever had. He ended, up, he ended up winning in 68 
after Kennedy was assassinated and Johnson got reelected, and in Vietnam was at the height of his mess, you know, Nixon got, was elected. But Nick, but according to all polls, Nixon won the radio debates. Why? Because people couldn't get the vision or the, the image of how Kennedy looked and how Nixon looked. They had to listen to the content of what they said. And it's changed politics forever. We don't listen to what people say anymore. We, look, we work on sound bites and how they look and how good looking they are. The, the, listen, the Democrats picked John Edwards about 15 years ago and started getting him groomed to run for Senate and everything. They wanted him to be president. They thought he was kid, Kennedy yes. And they could get him, get all the soccer moms to fall in love with him because he was a good looking guy. Come on. They thought he was a good looking guy. They were going to groom him. He was articulate. He, could, he had the look they were looking for. And they were just going to use the imagery to get him to be president. You can't make decisions based on things like that. Hello? And you get preachers that people just follow after them because they think they're cool, they're slick, and they're hip. They were the ensign. <coughs> listen to the content. Forget about, listen, you know how, do you have any idea how our numbers have exploded on the internet since we've gone to video over audio? I don't think we've ever approached the numbers we've got with audio that we're having with video uh, in, these, in these periods of time because people like video. They're, 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 they were so stimulated visually. Don't you think Satan knows that? Don't you think Satan knows how to manipulate you and the things of the world? And we got people who, who follow after, you know, Christian musicians or Christian bands or Christian preachers because they got this look and we're not listening to their content. Are they preaching the Bible? Now, I'm not saying I'm some dog, ugly preacher. I don't know what you think. I mean, my wife thinks I'm good looking. That's all that really matters. And my daughter's thinking I'm handsome. You know, Nathan, Nathan, I'm Nathan's buddy. He don't talk about whether I look good or not. You know, that's not, the guys don't, we, we just pound the fist. All right. <laughs> you know, I really, you know, it doesn't matter what you think. My, 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 my wife and girls do. That's all that matters to me. Hello. All right. But we've got to get back to listening to people and seeing what the Word of God says. What are they preaching? And I'm going to tell you something. You need to cut off people who aren't preaching Bible. Well, I, I walk in love to them. Yeah, walk in love to them. Just don't listen to them. If they're not going to preach the Bible, you can't listen to them. Why? They'll me mess up your decision-making paradigm. They'll mess it up where you won't make right, biblical, godly decisions, and it's going to cost you somewhere down the road. Hello? I said, hello? It's important. You cut off enough people out of your life, and you won't have anybody to be around when you need them. Think about that. You cut off enough people in your life, and you won't have anybody around when you need them. I don't need to go to church. I have me, me, I, me and God just have church in my backyard on Sunday morning. Hogwash. You qualified to preach to yourself? The Bible says he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting or maturing of the saints that we, until we come to the fullness of, of the measure of the stature of Christ. I mean, that's the whole Ephesians 4 thing there. He says he gave a, uh, those apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to do that in your life. You can't do it for yourself. Why do you think I go to Winter Bible and camp meeting and, and, and those things? I need to be ministered to as a pastor. I can't, I can't do it all by myself. I've got to be fed. I've got to be ministered to. I've got to have a pastor. Pastor Hagan's my pastor. Love Pastor Hagan. He's cool. You know? I mean, you may not, if you don't like Texans, that's, that's, well, whatever, but I like him. You know? He walked up to me one night, we were sitting at dinner, and he walked up and popped me on the side of the head, and I turned around, hey, pastor! I put my hand back for a second, and he took my hand and choked me with it. All right. Uh, Miss Lynette told me he, means he likes me. Okay. <laughs> I don't understand. Some people have kind of a, a honorary, teasing personality. I'm kind of like that. That's fine. You know? I love him. I think he's great. But I've got to have a pastor. You've got to sit in there and, and be taught. And I've seen people cut themselves off, 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 cut themselves off. And one day they, they don't have anybody around. Hello. And nobody can speak into their life. And nobody can give them information that they make right decisions with. 
We're going to take the Word of God. We're going to listen to the Word of God. We're going to make right decisions from the Word of God. We're going to live according to the Word of God. And when people don't give us the Word of God, we're not going to listen to it. So remember, remember back what I said earlier in the sermon. When, some, when you ask somebody for, for, for input on something, what's the thing you want to hear them say that you're going to act on? The Bible says, when you cut them off, when I, I tell you what I would do. And that's what they do is based on the Bible. Amen? All right. Glory to God. Thank you for joining us today. We appreciate you being with us in this service on the conclusion of our teaching, Making Right Decisions. Uh, I believe that if you'll go back and listen to our previous services on this and this and today's message, it'll really help you as a believer learn to walk in the place where right decisions is a normal part of your life. You're getting your information from the Word of God. You're acting on that information, and you're living according to that, which is really the lifestyle of faith, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So we appreciate you being with us today. We invite you to uh, go to our website at www.fbc.org and uh, check out all the information there. We have our schedule of services. We have audio uh, archives. We have video archives, uh, information about upcoming events at the church, um, ways that you can give and be involved in, to the, in our ministry financially if that's what God puts on your heart. We would appreciate you just uh, just following God and whatever he would have you to do. And uh, so, and, and just make sure that you, you stay uh, connected with our, our services because they're just, we believe they're anointed by God, they're blessing the people, and they're helping people in Jesus' name. Until next time, we declare unto you that you're the head and not the tail above, only not beneath. And we say this, that this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith.